Welcome to our listening party for the release of the new recording of West Point Symphony for Band, recorded by the West Point Band here at the United States Military Academy. My name is Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Toven, and I'm the commander and conductor of the West Point Band. We're here today uh, with a friend of ours from a nearby organization, Mr. Michael Boriskin of the Copeland House, and we'll hear from him in a minute. But I wanted to tell you a little bit about the West Point Band and its history. The West Point Band is the oldest band in the United States Army. It was formally founded in 1817 here on the grounds of the United States Military Academy at West Point, New York. Prior to that, however, we can trace our history all the way back to George Washington and the occupation of the fortification here during the Revolutionary War. The band consists of three main uh, sections. The concert ceremonial band is the largest of those sections. We also have the Benny Havens Band, which is our rock cover band, uh, which does a lot of work, especially with our cadets, entertaining them uh, at their social functions and things like that. And, and then we also have a, a group that's called the Hellcats. It's the only remaining field music group in the US military. And they still work every single day throughout the year to help regulate the duty day for the cadets and the staff and faculty here. As I mentioned, our guest today is Mr. Michael Boriskin. He is the artistic and executive director of the Copeland House. And Michael, if you would please tell us a little bit about yourself and about the Copeland House. I am delighted, I am thrilled to be here. Um, Copeland House is all about American music and as we often say about uh, uh, being the place where America's musical past and future meet and so this is uh, an ideal uh, collaboration, we hope the first of, of many, uh, where we are at the same time honoring America's rich, diverse musical uh, legacy as a way of guiding us into the future. And the meeting point uh, of this project is, as you've said, uh, this um, wonderful symphony for band by Roy Harris, who we'll be speaking about in a little while. Uh, Copeland House is a creative center for American music and the arts based at Aaron Copeland's National Historic Landmark Home in uh, northern Westchester County uh, with a newly acquired satellite uh, venue at the former Melrose School in southern Putnam County. Um, it uh, is the only composer's home in the United States devoted to championing uh, America's musical heritage through a broad range of activities. Uh, I have the honor of serving as the artistic and executive director. Um, I am trained as a concert pianist, which is what I do. Um, and um, uh, the Copeland House Ensemble will be uh, collaborating with uh, musicians from the West Point Band, and we are thrilled to be here as a as a, a, a history nerd, and specifically American history nerd. nerd. Uh, this kind of thing is a, is a natural. Uh, the Copeland House Ensemble uh, and I have just come back from a, a residency at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, which traces uh, its, uh, its lineage back to Thomas Jefferson, and now being here at uh, historic West Point and its, uh, its uh, uh, lineage back to George Washington, uh, this, is, this is a natural for us. Excellent, well, we're thrilled to have you here and really excited to, to launch this recording uh, in cooperation with you. Yes, for sure. Excited about it Excellent. also. So we're really thrilled to be here today uh, to release this recording of Roy Harris's West Point Symphony for Band. Uh, this work is part of a long history of collaborations in which the band has engaged all throughout its history. In this particular case, this was one of the works written for the Academy's sesquicentennial in 1952. 
Uh, it was actually one of 13 works that then commander and conductor Francis Resta had commissioned to mark this significant anniversary. Other composers that were engaged to write works were people like Darius Mio, William Grant Still, and Morton Gould. Uh, and the nice thing is that today we uh, continue that history of collaboration by being here with Michael, our friend from the Copeland House. So Michael, if you would, why don't you tell us a little bit about William, uh, Roy Harris and about this work in particular? I will, um, I, and I'm really looking forward to, to hearing this recording. Um, I've heard bits and pieces of it uh, up, up until now. It sounds fabulous. Um, and it's terrific that you uh, are really reviving this um, really vibrant uh, work for band by Roy Harris, um, because uh, Roy Harris is uh, sadly uh, not terribly well known um, at this point, even though he was for a big chunk of the 20th century regarded as one of the most prominent mm -hmm. figures in American music. You almost literally could not pick up a book uh, uh, or a newspaper that was uh, about um, American music subjects without coming across the name of Roy Harris. And he's almost a, one of the best examples of the mysterious ways that posterity uh, works uh, with artists. Um, as I say, he was so prominent and such a visible figure on the American music scene. And uh, after he passed away in the late 1970s, um, his music and his um, his place in, uh, on the American music scene kind of evaporated. Right. So it's wonderful uh, to, to, uh, you know, to be spending time with uh, the, the symphony that he wrote for the West Point Band. Um, Harris was kind of a, a, an emblematic American figure. He was born on Lincoln's birthday uh, in a small house in Oklahoma, um, then moved to, to California. Uh, around the turn of the 20th century with his family, grew up on a farm, uh, went east uh, in the 1920s where he actually met Aaron Copeland, mm -hmm. uh, which is one of, the, uh, one of the things that also brings us together in, the, in this project because they were both extremely prominent figures uh, and close colleagues for uh, much of both of their lives, uh, actually. Uh, Copeland um, uh, encouraged Harris to, be, uh, to go to Paris and study with Copeland's revered uh, professor, the, the uh, extraordinary Nadia Boulanger, which Harris did, came back to this country, um, began his career, uh, was a fairly prolific uh, composer, um, and I gather a rather uh, cantankerous uh, individual. Um, uh, one of the things that somehow sticks out in his biography is that uh, by the time he was in his mid-30s, he was already on his fourth wife. Oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> and um, was rather an idiosyncratic, uh, um, somewhat ordin ornery um, person. Uh, in, enjoyed uh, ec educational positions at a wide variety of, of colleges mm -hmm. around the country. Uh, as I say, was very prolific, um, wrote this piece in the 1950s, and the piece is, is um, pretty, uh, pretty symbolic of, of Harris's work, mm -hmm. um, which was noted for a kind of melodic and theatrical grandeur and, 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 uh, and rhetoric, uh, rhythmically complex, uh, interested in the inner workings of the instruments, which, mm -hmm. which uh, uh, we can speak more about. Um, the notion of uh, what we call polyphony and the, the dialogue, the conversations uh, amongst the instruments 
Um, and um, it's, it's quite a striking piece, and it's, it's kind of mm -hmm. wonderful that it's being revived through this recording. Indeed. Well, thanks for that, Michael. That's really great information. It helps set us up for, for hearing this really extraordinary work. Yes. Uh, so how about we do that? That sounds uh, great. What we're going to do is we're going to listen to it in three parts, uh, each movement separately. As we do that, we invite you, encourage you to leave comments in the, in the comment section. Uh, we're monitoring this live, so if you have questions, go ahead and post those. We'll try to answer them for you and give us feedback, what you think, what, you, what are your impressions about the work and about the recording. We really would love to hear from all of you.
So, Michael, I don't think there's any evidence that, that, the, that Harris had a, sort of a programmatic idea in mind uh, that, that he was necessarily trying to tell a story with this, but there is so much in here that, that speaks to West Point. I mean, of course, the, the, you know, the, the bugle calls uh, reminiscent of what happens day in and day out here to regulate mm -hmm. the duty day. Uh, and then I was, I was really struck by, uh, you probably caught me smiling in that first extended 5-4 <laughs> section. Yes. <laughs> uh, I, I, th I thought of some, you know, cadets having been out and maybe having had too good of a time and, and, and sort of hobbling back to, to campus. In fact, there's a, you'll appreciate this as a, as a history buff. Um, there was a very famous character named Benny Havens, and we name our, our the cover band, band yes. the Benny Havens Band. Mm -hmm. Benny Havens had um, an establishment that was on, on the installation. Uh, this was back in the uh, late 19th century. An establishment? An establishment for the cadets. <laughs> uh, but he wasn't allowed to sell alcoholic beverages, mm -hmm. but was doing it anyway. And so he got kicked off and moved down the Hudson. He reestablished uh, something there. He used to call, have this drink that he called the flip. Uh, and cadets would sneak out, like in the wintertime, they would sneak out and walk down the frozen Hudson, enjoy some flip, wow. and then stumble back <laughs> to campus, all trying not to get caught in the process. <laughs> so anyway, that was just something that, uh, that, that struck me in, in that. But what are your thoughts? You got, you got all of that out of this. Uh, I got all of that out of this, yeah. <laughs> Um, it, I um, had uh, similar thoughts about it. Um, you know, first of all, when you title something simply symphony for mm -hmm. band, um, that maybe suggests that you, are, you either don't have extra musical or programmatic notions mm -hmm. about the piece or you don't want to convey it. Mm -hmm. Um, and so there is something, uh, you know, kind of neutral about that title, but I had the same sense um, in, in thinking that um, this work was indeed project driven by the fact that he was writing this for the West Point Band. Mm -hmm. And this gets us onto something that is very important in terms of Harris's work, um, because one of the, one of the things that helped to define his place on the American music scene, as was the case with composers like Aaron Copland and Virgil Thompson, was that at uh, the early stages of their careers, they all helped to define what we've come to think of as a kind of American sound. Mm -hmm. And that's a whole other program uh, right. and a whole other conversation that we can have. But um, I, I agree with you that hearing all of those flourishes mm -hmm. at, the, at the beginning the, and the bugles and the, and the fanfare uh, sort of uh, put me in mind at least uh, with West Point and what this piece was all about, but also in the larger sense, the sort of Americanness. Yes. Of uh, of the of the music together with this kind of rhythmic swagger that mm -hmm. uh, that you're 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 getting the sort of dance like maybe even jazziness about it. Um, there's also something about what we discussed before was this this notion of the dialogues uh, that are constantly happening in various choirs of mm -hmm. of the band. You have that one section of of the clarinets and the bassoons, uh, uh, you know, working together with this, um, you know, sort of underlying commentary, mm -hmm. uh, this meandering commentary under the under the tune, uh, this sort of crunchy chords, yes. um, which you know give this piece a, a kind of uh, grit. Mm -hmm. um, while it's got this sort of jaunty, sunny uh, swagger, if, yeah. if mm -hmm. you will. So um, it, was, it was fun to hear and, and uh, wonderfully well, well played. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. You, you know, the, um, uh, speaking about that quintessential or, uh, you know, that American sound that Roy Harris was able to achieve and as well as you know somebody like Copeland, I can't help but 
uh, think about that, that the thing that, that connected them was both having studied with Nadia Boulanger and what a, an effect she had on American music because my, what I know of her, her teaching style was very much to help the composers find their own voice. And so with Copeland and with Harris and people like that, she was able to help them find that American voice and, and, and fine tune it. Which is the mark of a, a great mentor, a great teacher, professor in mm -hmm. almost any field, mm -hmm. is, to, is to give uh, anyone the, the tools and the technical skill to right. be able to mm -hmm. express themselves mm -hmm in the way they are seeking to uh, express themselves and not, as you say, not to sort of impose, uh, you know, mm -hmm. a, a kind of, um, you know, studio style. Right. And um, it, it's true, as you say, I mean, um, Nadia Boulanger was um, really an extraordinary figure, uh, certainly in 20th century American music, but you could say 20th century music, period, mm -hmm. because uh, she was such a, uh, a sought-after um, guru, mm -hmm. a musical mentor and, and guide. And, um, you know, when you think that, you know, she taught people as diverse as Aaron Copland and Philip Glass, and Quincy Jones, right. um, and that's just you know the start of of the many many prominent composers that came through her her uh, her studio in in uh, in Paris. Um, so yeah, I mean it, it's um, you know you you can see so much of this, you can hear so much of of this uh, kind of what was still in the 1950s a, a kind of, you know, almost second generation um, American sound and approach to, uh, to symphonic and band writing. Yeah. Well, something else interesting that you pointed out was, was at times the thickness of, of, the, uh, of the texture. Mm -hmm. and, and that he wrote this for the band as it existed in 1952. Uh, throughout history, military bands, army bands in particular, have waxed and waned. Um, this was uh, a heyday for military bands. It was probably a heyday for bands in general. Yeah. Uh, but to accomplish this recording, we had to uh, once again collaborate and bring in musicians from the New York City area to augment the band to make it the size that it was mm -hmm. uh, in 1952. Would that we were that large again. <laughs> However, it, it provided us the opportunity to once again, uh, you know, collaborate with with our musical colleagues in the area. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I I have to say, um, the interesting thing you talk about the thickness, and these are these are these are big scores, <laughs> yeah, um, and um, they are 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 well well populated here. But for me, the the interesting thing was how lean and yes. transparent mm -hmm. yes. the, the sound and the texture is, that you mm -hmm. really can, can hear everything that's going mm -hmm. on. That's kind of a mark of, of a, a terrific orchestrator. Mm -hmm. um, there is a lot going on, I think less maybe of thickness mm -hmm. uh, and more of just the activity yes. mm -hmm. uh, and the variety of, of sounds. Um, there are no strings right. uh, in, in this because this is band music and not symphonic uh, music, um, but you have all of the other sections uh, in, mm -hmm. you know, in, in an orchestra. You have the winds, you have the brass, you have the percussion, but you can hear all of that. Yeah. And it, mm -hmm. it is pretty transparent. Um, and that really struck me uh, hearing this now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes perfect sense. Yeah.
I start? You may. <laughs> um, because I, I was so struck by, um, you know, the beginning and so much of this second section, yes, yes. which was um, such a complete contrast mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, to, uh, to the opening, uh, which is what you, one would want, sort of theatrically speaking. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there were so many striking moments, even just starting from that uh, almost magical sort of uh, breath suspending yes. quietude of just four clarinets and, and a double just, bass. And a double bass. Right? Yeah, exactly. And we're looking at, you know, we have the, the big score that we're, you know, we've been talking about, right? right? Um, and it, it was all empty. Yes. Except for, you know, uh, the, yeah. just the, the clarinets and the, and the double bass coming in. And didn't it feel to you like it was this sort of very gradually controlled buildup? And it wasn't even so much a question of sort of getting louder and getting kind of dramatically intense, yeah. but that instruments would be mm -hmm. gradually added on. So first you start with this very spare mm -hmm. opening of, of clarinets and, and a double bass way down there. And then you have more movement, mm -hmm. gradually more movement with smaller note values, mm -hmm. not to get too technical about this, but um, the, the, the motion, the, the sense of forward push mm -hmm. gets gradually um, you know, gradually uh, added on to as, as the notes get faster. Right. And then there are more, more instruments that are added. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and all the while maintaining that transparency and achieving some of the most extraordinary colors. Yeah. You know, both harmonically and in the way he orchestrates and, and pairs instruments uh, together. The, um, uh, and I really like what you said about this gradual, and it, he takes a long time to, to build for this to grow, but he has your attention the entire time because yeah. the, the writing is just so exquisite, the melodies are interesting, the harmonies are captivating. Uh, it really is just, uh, you know, this is the meat here. Yeah. This is really extraordinary. We were talking about some of the crunchy, crunchy yeah. chords yes. Yes. early, early on, and it's in a different context here because now you don't have that kind of rhythmic drive that you had in the opening mm -hmm. section, mm -hmm. or in what we're what's still to come, but it's a you know a, a kind of a different kind of. Um, you know, sort of harmonic temperature, yes. if, if you will, yes. right? So let me ask you as a, as a conductor, if mm -hmm. I, I might, um, so what do you see when you see four clarinets playing by themselves <laughs> in terms of putting them all together and tuning them up? What kind of... Oh what my kind gosh, of, <laughs> yes. It, should we not it, talk it, about that? <laughs> Especially, you know, as this goes on, he starts in a little register, but then he has, you know, the entire section playing uh, you know, at, at, at the top of the register. Uh, so yes, I mean that that it takes extraordinary work, uh, and it, it's fear-inducing for a conductor. <laughs> uh, no, there was something that was really um, so reflective, uh, and you know, this is he takes his time, as you said. There's something very stately and kind of burnished about. Yes. about the sound and we already hear that he's you know he's moving towards the end mm -hmm. the, every the, the pace starts to pick up and um, you know we're we're pushing forward we're pushing forward to the to the final curtain indeed yeah. well why don't we listen to the final curtain Great.
A dramatic ending yes. indeed. <laughs> <laughs> and kind of <clears throat> something of a summation about, yes. mm -hmm. ab about it. Um, it was not a kind of super virtuosic finish, but yeah. just something that, you know, kind of, uh, you know, puts a ribbon on yeah. the whole, mm -hmm. whole thing. I mean, this has, has traced an interesting kind of journey, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. expressive journey and musical journey through all of this. Um, we had that contrasting, reflective middle section that we mm -hmm. talked about, which built and built and built. And the release was kind of uh, lighter and more playful somehow, a little yes. bit unexpected for that to be the release. Mm -hmm. And one might almost think that that would, that would make up the, the core of the finale. And mm -hmm. you'd have this sort of playful, right. uh, mm -hmm. sparkling, virtuosic end, but we don't quite get that. Not we get at this, all. you yeah, know, sort grand. of the grand. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Grand, um, brass, mm -hmm. brass uh, prominent. I don't want to say brass heavy, but yeah. brass. You know, these burnished brass that uh, sort of wraps the piece mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. And and what a contrast to the beginning. You know, it, it, the beginning was more virtuosic in that sense. You know, the first movement where lots of technical things going on. Uh, myriad time signature changes and interesting things like 5-4 and whatnot, and, uh, or 5-2. Uh, and, and, and yet here, the, the, the analogy that, that came to my mind is, you know, what you can create with seemingly simple ingredients, right? You don't have to go for the flash. It's like, a, it, it's, it, it's like when you have a fine meal, you know, that's not crammed with things, but there's such simplicity to it, and yet, you know, the, the flavors, and, and mm -hmm. especially when it's by a, a really great chef, the interplay of the flavors and whatnot just brings so much delight. And that's what I think Harris is doing in these last two movements in particular. Yeah, yes, and you start with simple ingredients, but the more you put in, the more complex yeah, it, right. it, it gets. Yeah, it was a treat to hear this, and mm -hmm. congratulations oh, to the thanks. you know to the band. Uh, I, I mean, it just sounded fabulous. Thanks. Well, we we've got to give a lot of people uh, credit for that. Uh, first of all, this all took place before my tenure. Uh, uh, I got here. Um, just after this recording was completed. So I first have to give a shout out to my predecessor, Lieutenant Colonel Retired Todd Addison, who conceived of this project and, and brought it to fruition. Um, one of the things he did was, uh, in addition to bringing in all these other players to recreate the band to the size that it was in 1952, uh, but he brought in a, a, a well-known wind conductor, Robert Ponto, who is a, 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 an expert in the music, the wind music of Harris. And so he brought him in to, uh, uh, to, to realize the work with, with our players mm -hmm. and our guests. Um, and we did this, uh, we recorded it at Marist College, which is just north of here uh, in New York in, in Poughkeepsie. And we had some extraordinary people also uh, working alongside in the, in the background. Uh, first of all, our chief audio engineer, Master Sergeant Brandy Lane, is actually a Grammy Award winner, uh, sound engineer, recording artist. That's handy. So, yeah, yeah, right? <laughs> An embarrassment of riches. Uh, so she was, she was our lead audio producer, and then, and then we leveraged technology and had uh, a gentleman by the name of Dan Mercurion who was the producer, but he wasn't here with us. He was, he was producing uh, at a distance and plugged into us, you know, over the internet and, and, and made all of that happen. So it-, it Ain't we, technology great? <laughs> oh, there are some good things that came yes, out of the they, pandemic, yes. right? <laughs> uh, but we're really grateful to, to all of those folks who, who, helped to realize, uh, who helped realize this project and, and we're so thrilled that now it's, it's getting out there. And we're so thrilled that you could be with us here today. My to, pleasure. You know, just you know, such brilliant observations and, and, and uh, uh, really walking us through the piece and, and pointing out some of the, the, the extraordinary things that, that went into the, to the making of, of this composition. Well, it was terrific hearing it. I mean, this is just 
the, the kind of music, the kind of project, um, and the kind of collaboration that, that uh, uh, you know, that Copeland House is, is all about. Um, <clears throat> we're animated it by the way Aaron Copeland lived his life mm -hmm. as um, really a, a, a peerless champion for his fellow composers. Yeah. And uh, so I'm, I'm uh, thrilled to be here listening uh, to this wonderful piece, talking to you about it, and being in this, uh, you know, this historic, uh, historic spot. So thank you for having me. I, I look forward to chatting with you again and making music together. Oh, likewise. Uh, yes. Well, and thank you so much for what you do with the Copeland House to carry on uh, Copeland's work and passion for for uh, the American uh, music scene. He was a, he was a singular, a singular artist and a singular individual. Wow, I could say the same for you. So thank, thank you. you very much for being here today. My pleasure. Thanks, Thanks Michael. Michael. Thanks. Mm -hmm.